Um, I want to talk tonight briefly about three stories and three lessons. I love stories, and I'm glad that the Bible is filled with different stories. Um, the three characters that I want to talk about, they have something in common, and they were all Roman soldiers. They were centurions. They were Roman officers. And what that meant is that meant that they were in charge of 100 people. That was their, their rank. And the first one that I want to talk about, um, referring to him, it says that Jesus marveled at him. Man, would you like that next to your resume? I made Jesus marvel at me. I just think that that is so amazing to have the Son of God be astonished and amazed by something that someone had did in a good way. And this centurion, I want to talk about his faith and why his faith was so strong and why Jesus stopped and was, it actually said that he marveled and he was amazed. And he said it to all of those that were around him. In fact, his words were, I've never seen such a great faith, not even in Israel. And Israel was the capital of religion of if you were going to be perfect that's the place that you were going to be if you were going to have all these good works that's the place that you were going to be and this one that he said it about he wasn't even a jew he was a roman soldier so if you're not familiar with this story in just a nutshell he had a servant working for him that apparently was very close to him so that lets me know that he was a good humanitarian. He didn't look at people as just employees, but he looked at people as individuals. And they got close to his heart. And this servant had gotten very, very sick. And he had gone around doing a lot. I'm going to stand over here. He had went around doing a lot of good deeds for the Jewish people. He had a relationship with them guy was we're going to try on this side now i think this guy was uh <laughs> was very uh very well known and very well liked by a lot of people he had good people skills and so he called the his buddies that were the jewish elders and he said my servant man my servant's really sick and i know that you know jesus would you just would you ask him would you ask him to pray he didn't ask him to come to his house. He said, would you ask him to pray? So the elders, yes, because see, this centurion not only was kind to them, this centurion actually donated money and helped them to build a temple. And so they thought, yes, we will do anything for you. So they went to Jesus and they said, Jesus, there's a centurion that let him know it was Roman. And he said, and he has a servant that is sick. Would you please come and pray for him? And he deserves this. Let's tell you, let me tell you about all the good things that he's done for us already. He, he, he deserves for you to come and do this. He's been really good to us, Jesus. So please come and heal the servant. And so Jesus, <laughs> Jesus says, yes. <laughs> And so they're on their way. Well, the centurion finds out that Jesus is like coming to his house. And he tells his servants, he says, Go, tell him he doesn't have to come to my house. I didn't expect this. Tell him that once he says the word, that's all I need. He says, because I am in a place of authority. And when I tell my soldiers to come, they come. And when I tell them to go, they go. I'm not worthy of him to even come into my household. Just tell him to speak the word. <laughs> when that message got to Jesus, <laughs> just like I'm trying to get it to you, <laughs> um, that's when he said, I'm amazed. I'm amazed and I marvel at this faith and sure enough just as jesus spoke the word he found out his servant was made whole so there's a few lessons that we want to look at with this centurion in this short 
little story of how to have faith that even amazes your Savior. So the first thing, if you want to notice about his great faith, a few things that make your faith great in God's eyes, is that he wasn't being selfish. This wasn't about him. He didn't think, oh, if I lose this servant, then this is going to cost me this much money, and I need to get somebody else to replace him. It says that he was dear to his heart. That moved the heart of God. So his focus of his faith was for the benefit of another person. This person was dear to him, and it was all about the other person completely. There wasn't a selfish agenda to this faith at all. His faith was active. In other words, when he heard about Jesus, he did something. In the Bible, if you'll pay attention to the times that people were healed, very few of them did Jesus go to them. Most of them are coming after Jesus. So that lets us know if our faith is going to be great, we have to make a step. We have to do an action. It said that he heard that Jesus was close. And then he sent his servants. His faith was active because the Bible says that faith without works, it's dead. And I don't know about you, but nothing dead has ever really benefited me except for the meat that I eat. That's good. I want that dead. But anything else in life that's been dead, a dead plant's not going to do me any good. Dead person sitting next to me, that's really not going to do me any good. So he says that your faith without works it's dead. It's like it didn't even exist. So this guy, he did something. The third thing about this faith is it wasn't dependent on his good works. He didn't give God a list of, here's what I've done for you. See what I went through? See where I've, I've suffered for you? Because this centurion said, I don't even deserve for you to come underneath my household underneath my roof. I don't even deserve that. He knew he didn't deserve it, but through God's eyes, God makes us worthy. There's nothing that we can do. We cannot make a big enough account that we can throw that up to God and say, see, I did this. This is why you need to do it for me. We know that we're not worthy of anything. We weren't even worthy of him to die on the cross, yet he chose to do it. And this centurion knew I'm not even worthy of this, but because you say, I believe in your word, just because you said it. So his faith didn't depend on his works. See, he didn't make the request of Jesus because of his works and his goodness. It was based on Jesus' works and Jesus' goodness. The word of Jesus was the only evidence that his faith required just say the word. That's all I need. That's what God's wanting to hear from us. He's wanting to say, wanting us to hear, to say, you said it, I believe it, that's all I need. That's all I need to know. As you said it, and I know it's going to happen. The other centurion that I want to talk about, I kind of call him the shipwrecked centurion. We're going to learn a little bit about his story. from him. <laughs> I feel sorry for the camera person. <laughs> I'm like all over the stage tonight. Um, so what happened here in this centurion story, another Roman soldier, officer, he has the job of taking Paul one place across the sea to another place to get trouble. And they were ready at this to I'm standing everywhere you told me to stand, and it's not working. <laughs> We're going to try this. Um, okay, so anyway, um, he was going to take Paul on this ship. And Paul said, mm, I don't think we should leave yet. I perceive a, a warning. And I think there's going to be a disaster, and I think we may even lose some lives if we're not careful. Well, but the weather looked fine. And in fact, the wind was blowing just right. But the centurion li listened enough to go to the captain, and he said, hey, um, 
what do you think about us leaving now? Do you think this is a good time to leave? And he's like, yes, everything's perfect. In fact, because if we stay here too long, then we really will be in for rough water. And the owner of the ship was there. Now, the owner of the ship, he's invested in this ship. This cost him a lot of money. So they asked him, they said, what do you think? And he says, of course I think we should go ahead and go. The weather's fine. Not going to be an issue. Well, just into the trip, they were actually tossed about the sea, it says, for two full weeks. For two full weeks, it had... They hadn't seen the moon. They hadn't seen the stars. At this point, the Bible tells us that whatever Paul said to do, the centurion did without question. <laughs> whatever it is that you want me to do, yes, I will do it. And Paul then tells him, he says, I had a vision, and God showed me that we will survive, and we will make land, and here's the place that we're going to that we're gonna land. And sure enough, that is what happened. The boat broke apart, and they did make it to land. And that centurion, from that point on, did everything that Paul said. So the lesson that we can learn from him is, if you know somebody, if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, if you get that inkling, man, listen up. Because the Holy Spirit isn't talking just because he doesn't have anything to do. He's trying to let you know. And come to find out, um, the centurion and him became very, very good friends. And he was very grateful to this prisoner named Paul who saved their lives lesson that that centurion can teach us that we must be sensitive and listen to the prompting the last one that I want to talk about is one that touches my heart so much and it's a centurion that he was there at a pivotal play, place in history his job was not only to overlook all of the soldiers but his job was to be a guard for those that were going to be crucified. And his story, if you want to read it, it's found in the 27th chapter of Matthew. And I'm going to read one verse tonight, and then I'm going to talk just a little bit more about the centurion. 2754 says, So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake. And the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, truly, this is the Son of God. What I want you to pay attention to in that verse is it said, when they saw the earthquake and they saw the things that had happened, they came to the conclusion that this truly was the Son of God. See, that lets me know that the centurion, being a bodyguard, he's got to be watchful. He's watching everything that's taking place from the beginning to the end. He saw and experienced the earthquake. He saw the skies grow dark. And he saw and he watched Jesus and Jesus' actions. He saw that as Jesus was on the cross, and this wasn't his first crucifixion he had seen many and pr probably hundreds and thousands by this point he was the same they would all scream out they would agonize and want to be set free but this one was different he stayed close to Jesus Jesus but he didn't hear Jesus cuss or say poor pitiful me or even moan or groan very much. The thing that Jesus said that stopped him in the tracks was, Father, forgive them. What kind of man can look out at this crowd of haters and unbelievers and know that because of them and their hatred, that they're going through this agonizing pain and not once did he talk about how he hurt, but he said, forgive them. 
And then he saw him embrace a man with his words. He couldn't get his arms down, but the words embraced and comforted the man's heart. The man that just a few moments prior to this was ridiculing Jesus because Jesus wouldn't come and rescue all of them if he was who he said that he would, was. Being then said, remember me. He knew there was something different. Maybe he had heard about Jesus. Maybe his reputation went before him. And maybe he doubted because surely a son of God would not stay on a cross. Yet the atmosphere changed when he said, Father, forgive them. And he wanted to be part of that. I don't know his story. I don't know why he's there on the cross. But maybe he never felt good enough. But that changed when he was next to Jesus. You know how it is when you walk up to somebody and all of a sudden you just, you just have a good feeling? You, maybe you've never even met them before, but you just, you just like them. And then other ones, they can walk in the room and you're like, no, nah, I'd rather not. There's just a different feeling. Well, you can't tell me that being that close to Jesus, that there's not something different in the air. And this guy, it had penetrated the walls around his heart. It had penetrated his mind. And he just said, remember me. And Jesus, with his compassion, his love, you'll be with me in paradise. He embraced him with his words. I don't care how hard-hearted this centurion guard had to be because you know you can't see person after person die and feel every single one you have to get you have to get a little tough to it you have to look at it a little bit differently but this was already I could tell softening his heart because he was watching and he was listening and then the other thing that stood out that the centurion is watching is even on the cross Jesus wasn't thinking about himself he was thinking about everybody else. And before he took his last breath, one of the things that he said to his mom and John, the disciple that were there, he said, here's your son. Here's your mother. What he was doing there was he was letting John know, I'm giving the responsibility to you. Look after my mom. He was letting his mom know, you're not going to have to worry about who's going to take care of you and where you're going to live. John's going to take care of you. Even on the cross, he was thinking about others, and he was thinking about his family. And then it says, so therefore, let's go back a little bit. He noticed a difference in Pilate. Pilate had passed the judgment on Thousands of crucifixions. No big deal to him. No sweat off of his back. The law says crucify him. Crucify him. But the centurion, if he didn't have his helmet on, would have scratched his head thinking there's something different. He's, Pilate's ask, acting a little bit nervous. He's not the full confident self that he usually is. Usually he comes out and he tells the crowd, you know, here's what it is and we'll crucify him. But it seems like Pilate's trying to backtrack on this one. And I can't put my finger on it. I've never seen this before. And in fact, Pilate even says, I can't find anything wrong with this man. And Pilate gets to the point he keeps trying to say, shouldn't we release him? And the crowd says no. So Pilate does something that the centurion has never seen before. He gets out a bowl of water and he washes his hands and he says, I'm washing my hands of this one. Even Pilate knew there was something different about this man. And when the earth began to shake and the darkness came in, it just confirmed to him that was the icing on the cake. And he said to those around him, Surely, this is a 
that this was the Son of God? Because it said that he watched him. The things that he said and the actions, the things that he did. So what lesson do we have from that one? We have the lesson that people are watching us. Because if we claim to be a Christian, you have people watching what we do and watching what we say. And I know that with every interaction that I have, my goal is for them to walk away going, I know she's a Christian. She didn't even have to tell me. But I knew, I knew because I could just tell the way that she handled things, the way that she didn't lose her temper when other people would lost her temper, the way that she acted. Because of the signs on the outside, I could tell what was going on on the inside. That's as Christians should be, because we are the living testimony. See, Jesus isn't walking here in flesh any longer. We can't point to that one and say, right over there, there's, there's Jesus. There's Jesus right there. There's the original. But no, Jesus said that we would do his works, that we were going to be his hands extended. We were going to be his words and be his feet. So in this lesson right here, the centurion tells me that it matters what you do. You do make a difference. So I want you to know that even the smile on your face to somebody, that shouts Jesus, whether you know it or not. The time that you were patient and you were understanding with them, that screamed Jesus. I want you to know that that's why God says, don't be weary and well-doing because at the right time, you're going to reap. And see, we so often think about here on earth, and that's okay. You will be blessed here on earth. But what he's talking about more than anything is he's talking about that eternal reward where you see the harvest of souls that you influenced. Don't you think it's going to be wonderful when people walk up to you and say, I remember you. You were the one that smiled at me when everybody else was frowning. I remember that you were kind and you, you spoke to me in the doctor's office when nobody else would pay attention. I re remember when you, you sent me a text and said, I'm praying for you. I remember those gestures. And because of your gestures doing that, you led me to think that there's some good still in this world. And then I got to thinking, what is it that's different about them? See, you never know. It's your ministry is in not just the great things, but the smallest details, even to the way that you answer the phone has an influence and has a ripple effect on somebody. Man, I think that's awesome. I don't say it to make you feel bad. I say it to encourage you. Never let the enemy tell you that, it doesn't matter what you do. You don't really do anything big. It's just the idea of you being you and being kind. Because somebody's watching. Somebody's watching and they're learning and they are looking at you for a representative of what a Christian should be like. That's an honor. That's an honor to have God trust us enough to say, I want you to be the light of the world. So that's what that centurion taught me is somebody's watching. I want to quickly just sum up a, a story that I had heard a, a church and this church was, we're going back here now, this church was um, a very big church and he was well known. And so the pastor picked him, this other pastor up from the airport, and they went to the hotel, and the hotel had been extremely busy that weekend, and the room wasn't ready yet. And the visiting pastor said to him, it's okay, it's no big deal. I can hang out in the lobby. Well, this other pastor had walked up to the little girl at the desk, the young girl, and he started berating her because the room was not ready and he said, do you not know who I am? Do you not recognize me? And we spend 
thousands of dollars here with your establishment. And here's where I bring the, the pastors to come in. And he just, you could see her just melting and she was so upset and he just wasn't stopping and he was making a scene and everybody was recognizing he was he was the pastor he's a pastor you see on tv the pastor that's written books oh everybody knows this pastor and the visiting pastor was just so humiliated and he finally told the other pastor he said it's okay he says i'm going to sit back here in the in the reception area i'm going to read my book i've been wanting to read it anyway and it's, it's all good. You come and pick me up in a couple of hours and we'll be ready to go to church. So he gets him out of there. And the little girl's in tears. The visiting pastor goes up to her and he says, I am so sorry. That was wrong. That is not a good representative. And he said, I don't want you to judge all of us by what you just saw happened here. And she said, you know, I had gotten invited to his church last weekend, and I really wanted to go. She says, but not so much now. She said, but are you going to be preaching tonight? And he says, yes, ma'am, I am. And she says, then tonight I'm going to come, and if you'll come down to the altar with me, I'm going to become a Christian, but that's not going to be my home church. So see, he could that situation happen, but instead he went to correct it. So I really hope, because all of us have a story of Christians that's done us wrong, that didn't act very Christian-like. And I really hope that when we see situations like that, that we will go and try to redeem God's name. I, uh, at one point, I was picking up a, a little boy that went to my daughter's school, and I don't know how we got on the subject somehow, but the neighborhood that he lived in also um, lived one of our church members. And um, I had no idea what the reputation of this person was like in public because I only saw this person at church. And I said, oh, I know you do. And I said, yeah, she goes to our church. She does. She's a Christian. And I said, yes. And he goes, well, we call her the grouch of the neighborhood. And he said, but she goes to your church. And I said, yeah. And he goes, but you're not grouchy. You're always nice. And I said, yeah, because I try to be Christ-like. And he goes, well, then if that's what a Christian is like, then I'm going to be your kind of Christian. So see, it matters it matters what we're like out outside of these walls. I don't know if any of you had worked food service, but one of the hardest people to deliver food to in a restaurant is a bunch of Christians. Have you been there? <laughs> yeah. They usually don't tip very well, and they're usually very, very picky, and um, it's nice to come along and let people know that you are a Christian. And when I am out, I make sure that I tip very well and I make sure that I'm very understanding because it's an honor to represent our Savior. So anyway, those are the three things, the three lessons that I learned from those centurions. And I know that each and every one of you here tonight, I can tell you, and I want to thank you for that, I'm proud anytime somebody says, do you know such and such? And I don't have to hesitate. I can smile and I can say, I sure do. They go to my church and I'm very proud of them. And usually I will say that because if they were going to say something negative, I stop it before it starts because then I get the mama bear look on my face. Like, don't you even <laughs> say anything bad about these people right here because I know how your hearts are. Yeah, we all mess up. But I know your heart's desires is to live a life that will turn and make the Son of God turn around and say, I'm amazed. I marvel at this person and their faith. So I want you to know that this week I'll be praying special for each and every one of you because even if you haven't changed anybody else's life, and I know you have, each of you that's here, you've touched my life. You've inspired me. 
And you might say, well, no, you don't know me. I've, this is my first time here. But yeah, you chose to come here tonight. So that makes me happy to know that you come to, to come to church tonight to learn more about God. And to me, that's still an inspiration. So in closing, I just want to tell you that I'm proud of you. I love you. Keep going like you're going. And let's set this world on fire for our Heavenly Father. God bless you.